Well, good morning, Horizon Church. Would you join us as we worship our God this morning? Come on. This is. This is the day you made. Rejoice and be glad, rejoice and be glad in me. This is what I believe. You are more than enough, more than enough for me. You are faithful to your promise. You are strong. You are 
church. We learned this song a couple weeks ago. We're going to keep the joy up. We're going to keep the energy high. We're going to sing of the resurrection power of Jesus. blessings 
and the protection and the provision and everything you've promised us. It's your presence, Lord. More than any of the things you can do, just you, Jesus. We love you.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind because I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus cause your name is power your name is healing Every stronghold shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul.
college, one of the one of the jobs that I had was working up north in a fishing resort. As we were worshiping today, I felt like the Lord wanted to speak a specific situation, but to paint a picture for you. And I remember one time we were in boats fishing along the shore and a thick, thick fog rolled in. And I'd been warned working up north that a fog can come in, it can really disorient you. Like, ah, it doesn't matter too much. I'm, I can see shore, we're not too far out. And I saw this wall of fog begin to come in. And I remember being told that if you ever get in there, your own instincts, what you think, you need to give up and you need to trust your navigation. Or you can get in a real tricky situation. And I remember I saw the fog coming in, and so I radioed to the other boats. It was my responsibility for the boats that were there, these guests that were there, to bring them back to the ship. And I remember saying, hey guys, reel up, fog's coming in, we need to go. And then by the time to reel up the rod and get things ready, I look around and I can no longer see land at all. And, I, and I, everything in me thought one direction was the way I needed to go. And I said, okay guys, just follow me. So we begin to go and, and we're going and we're going. And the time it should have taken to see shore, I'm not seeing shore at all. And I begin to panic. Not just my life, but I got other guests with me and I'm like, okay, what's going on? And, and I begin to stop and all of the questions, you got this one guest saying, no, I think we need to go this way. No, I'm pretty sure it's this way. All these other voices trying to give direction. I'm panicking, but in a moment I had to stop. Say, hold on, look down at my GPS. And the way it said to go, I was like, you gotta be kidding me, there's no way. But I had an opportunity and, and I had a test in that moment, am I gonna trust what I know to be north? And despite my confusion, despite what I think's going on, despite the other voices, say, guys, you need to trust me in this. I know we got a lot of questions, but what we need to get to first is shore. And once we can see shore, once we're good, then we can begin to navigate our side. I know you got questions. You need to put those on pause because the most important point, most important thing in this moment was to figure out the direction we needed to go and to get to shore. And this morning, I'm not sure what you walked in. We just sang a song saying the power over addiction. It may be where you at, the storm, the fog, the confusion. You may be in the mundaneness. It's been a while since there's been passion. Maybe you're struggling with an addiction again and again and you can't seem to cut it. Or your marriage, you keep trying to do things, but every time you bring something up, it's another fight. You're not sure what to do. Or your kids are, and you're just hopeless, whatever it is. Maybe it's fine. Whatever storm, whatever disappointment you find yourself in, the fog of life has rolled in. And in moments where we want answers, we say, God, what's going on? I, it's doing everything I thought you told me to do. When you're not sure what to do, and you think this answer is so important, or no, I, it needs to be this. Everything this morning, why we gather to worship, and look up, because the most important thing in the midst of a storm family, is you gotta find Jesus. Your questions, sure, put them aside. Your pain, he's more than capable. Your addiction, he died and the power and the resurrection of Christ is available to you through the Holy Spirit. He can take care of that. But more than your questions, more than your struggle, more than your doubts, more than your disappointment, the reason we stand and worship and sing the name of Jesus is because it orients us once again to the person and the power of Jesus in his word, he says he is the cornerstone that we start with. He says, I am the light of the world. So if you find yourself in a dark place this morning, friends, the reason we stand and sing the name of Jesus, because it reminds us what's most important. And if you would be willing to say, God, despite everything going on, I just need you. Despite my question, Despite, despite my disappointments, God, if I can just get to your feet, I know everything's going to be okay. If you find yourself here this morning, maybe you're yet to follow Jesus. Darkness and confusion would be how you describe your life. Can I tell you the good news 
of my Savior Jesus, that he died and he came to earth and he paid for every mistake you have made and you will ever make. And he offered you new life in Christ Jesus, that he will wipe away every sin if you would put your faith and your trust in him. Friends, you don't have to walk in darkness because the light of the world has come and his name is Jesus. And available to you this morning is to throw up your hands and say, I don't know where to go. I'm in a place where I'm stuck. But all at Jesus, if you're real, if you're here, if you're available, would you speak to me? Would you come into my life? Would the light of the world come and give me some sort of hope and direction? So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you this morning, with no one looking around, I want you to just put up your hand. I want to pray. And believe that in the darkness, if you don't follow Jesus at all, and you're saying, I need the light of the world to come into my life, if that's you this morning, we just want to make an opportunity. Say, Jesus, would you come forgive me of my sins? Would you come lead my life? Just give a moment. Yeah, come on. Awesome. Anyone else? Yeah. So Jesus, for those hands that went up, Father, I thank you that your word says when we are obedient to confess our sin to you and confirm and confess that you are the Lord of the universe, that you are exactly who you said you were, and invite you to come and live in us, Lord, that you begin to direct that your closeness, your love and presence comes close. For everyone else, I'm not sure where you find yourself this morning, but I know one thing. In the midst of the fog, one of the most powerful things you can decide to do is simply declare the name of Jesus and wait for the fog to pass because you know that Jesus is the one thing that will last. So if we could just the vocals one more time, say, I want to speak the name of Jesus, just to declare that as we transition this morning. But whatever you are, just to put your hands up, if you're willing and able this morning, as a sign of surrender, as a sign of signaling heaven. Whatever you're going through in your situation, let's declare the name of Jesus one more time. Come on, I want to speak the name of Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Come on, declare it over your situation, fam. Over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Let's do that again. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus So Father we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit in fresh measure this morning Every hand and situation that is represented Would you flood and overwhelm the things that may be overwhelming them love, your power, your peace. Father, our north star, our cornerstone, the light of the world, we set our eyes on you, Jesus, knowing that if we can just get to you, we're going to be okay. So Father, I pray for every situation, every marriage, every life, every job, every workplace, every family represented by the hands in the air this morning. God, I thank you that you are more than enough, and I pray that you would reveal your goodness and your power and your love to them this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give the Lord a, a victorious hand clap of praise, declaring, Lord, you're able. In every circumstance, Jesus, we thank you. Father, in every situation, you're powerful, you're moving, you're working. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can grab your seats. Thank you, worship team. We're going to continue in our, our worship this morning as we take up our tithes and offerings. We believe at Horizon Church that if you follow Jesus, part of your worship and response to the good news of Jesus in our life is to respond in generosity in every area of our life. That also includes our finances. So there's a couple ways to give on the screen. You scan the QR code. There's also back of some of the chairs, there's a QR code. You can scan for give there. You got e-transfer, everything else. 
like that. If you're visiting today, please feel no obligation to give. But if you call this place home and you follow Jesus, let's continue to follow in obedience and worship with our tithe and returning generously our offering to him. Father, we thank you for who you are. We pray you would bless us as we give. Lord, as we worship, we trust you with every area of our lives. God, I pray for those that need jobs, those that need their finances to turn around. Lord, that as we honor you and put you first, Matthew 6, says that the rest of life gets reordered and goes well because you're a God who sees and cares. So God, I pray that over us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The baskets, if you're kind of, you know Horizon, you know, you can pass them along the way. They're on your right, my left. Just grab those baskets, pass them. Our ushers will grab that. And we got one really exciting announcement. Caleb. Yeah, so we have a team uh, that we're prepping to go to Uganda, a missions trip. And so we're doing a fundraiser today after service. Is that in the courtyard? You'll see it. You'll smell You'll it, see it before you see so we're it. Go why, that way later. why will we smell it, Caleb? Because we're making some hot dogs, and these are going to be by donation. So this will be the best $100 hot dog you have ever eaten. I promise you. The best you $200 that. hot dog you've ever had. The best it will $500. not be the best five cent hot dog it, you've ever no, had. No, no. But uh, it'll be the donations we go in towards helping out the team. Uh, so after service, you'll want to stick around, grab yeah. a hot dog, make donation, help out with the team. Yeah, and if you've been around for any of our mission updates or our Legacy Sunday, we're heading to Uganda uh, to Father's Heart Mobility. Pastor Shannon will be taking a team in October. And so this is a great opportunity to be a part of that. And if you're wondering how to give today, uh, there will be a debit card machine out there that you can do donations, you can give cash. Or if you'd like to just e-transfer, you just need to put in the memo, Uganda, all right? And we'll make sure everything, the after service from the debit machine, cash they have a petty cash there for you yeah. and then uh the e-transfer that will go to the missions team uh that's heading to uganda which we're really really excited as about. well as if you're doing cash or the dev machine make sure to write that on for the yeah. uh horizon missions team to uganda just make yeah. a little note on there for it yeah and, and again it is by is by donation all right not by intention not by best wishes we we do covet and welcome your prayers but that won't get you a hot dog today, all right? Talent, this is treasure portion. So yeah, this is the treasure. That, this is yeah. the time, talent, appreciate it. But hey, it's going to be good. After service, we'll give you a bit more direction after that. All right, now I'm going to invite up Pastor Ryan. He's going to be continuing through our series uh, in parables. So let's give a hand clap for Pastor Ryan. Well, good morning, church. How we doing? Okay, we'll just rewind. Hey, church, how we doing? That's good. Now, if you're actually feeling blah, that's okay. I just, I just assumed I didn't give you enough time to respond to that question. Uh, it's good to be together. It's good to be in his presence. Amen. Yes. Amen. Uh, it is a joy and a privilege uh, to be able to be part of Horizon Church and to be able to come uh, and share from the word occasionally. Uh, it's one of the, the joys of my life to be able to share. And so uh, thank you uh, for the opportunities to share. Um, we're going to continue a series in the parable. So if you have your Bible, which I'd encourage you that it wouldn't be if you have your Bible, that you'd bring your Bible to church. Uh, you could follow along, make sure I'm not preaching heresy. Uh, and if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 13, uh, we want to look in and dive into God's word together. As we read a parable that I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, actually, uh, uh, Craig and Shannon don't know this. I switched to parable. I hope that's okay. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm excited to preach this parable is as I was uh, reading through our, um, uh, the Gospels, with, if you had that little bookmarky thing, there was a parable that I saw that I realized I have never read this parable. Not have I never heard it preached before, but I'm like, I can't even remember reading this parable. I've read through the Gospel of Matthew multiple times, the Bible. I couldn't remember it. And so we want to look at a parable today that's only two verses. Uh, and I'm excited to look and see what God would reveal to us, uh, that through faith uh, we can receive what God has for us this morning. And so if you're in Matthew chapter 15, that's where we're going to be. Uh, I, quick hello. I don't know where the camera is when I look this way. Uh, how's it going, Astrid and Bjorn? Uh, good to see you. They're on the island this weekend, and they're coming back uh, today, but it's good to say hello to them. That's my wife, if you were wondering, and my beautiful baby boy. Uh, but let's, <laughs> yes, let's dive on in together. I'm just going to read. It's not going to be very long. Uh, two verses, and then we're going to endeavor together. I'm going to check the time. Great. We're doing good. 
Uh, if you're doing good, say, I'm doing good. Awesome. I believe that God uh, not only wants to speak through this word, but I think uh, that for many today, there, people are going to experience freedom and healing today. And so I want to stir some faith uh, because I really believe it's been confirmed by a couple uh, people already. I think God has something in store for us this morning, and I don't even know. And that's the exciting part of walking with the Lord. Amen? So, Matthew chapter 13, we're going to read two verses, verse 51 and 52. It says, Jesus says, have you understood all these things? They answered to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Old. This morning, I want to encourage us that Jesus invites his disciples to be treasure hunters. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you again for your word. And God, we come to you now in faith. We come to you humbly, but we also come with confidence that you speak to your kids. And so God, I ask in a fresh way that you would open our ears to understand you, uh, that you would come and motivate from the inside out motivated out of love and of devotion and of joy to follow you and to obey you this morning. So Holy Spirit, would you come, would you empower me as we look to your word in Jesus' name, somebody said, amen. amen. Well, uh, we read in that verse and I mentioned treasure hunting, which is kind of an interesting thing. I don't know what it is about humans that we seemingly like love the idea of treasure, especially hidden treasure. I can remember being a kid, you often had, you know, X marks the spot. There's this idea of, will we find some treasure? Uh, it's kind of all over the place. In human history, people love looking. Uh, I remember, it just reminded me uh, of a guy I met in Paraguay one time. He wanted me to send him $2,000 so that he could buy a, a metal detector, because apparently there's a lot of, of, of treasure in Paraguay. I'm not lying. I really got that text message. And I'm like, you know what? I don't think that's what the Lord has for us, but bless you in your but searching for treasure. But here's the thing. Not many of us here are panning for gold. Anybody pan for gold before? I'm expecting Anita to say yes, um, but there's no, she hasn't. But again, we, in today's modern age, we're not often finding treasure, but there is a modern form of treasure hunting that maybe you have participated in, that maybe you like. And that modern form of treasure hunting is called thrifting. Anybody? Oh, wow. There was a woo. That's pretty good. <laughs> there is a woo. There is something exciting about going to the thrift store. You know, one of my favorites is called Vivi Boutique. Anybody heard of Vivi Boutique? That's Value Village for those not... Uh, initiated into the special club. But I love uh, going thrifting, not only because it's cheap, but it's really exciting. You go into the thrift store. Often, isn't it really cool that a lot of thrift stores are connected to the events of the gospel? That is, you buy that item of clothing, you know that you're sending missionaries and Bibles out. Praise the Lord. Let's all go thrifting later. Anyway, <laughs> but when you go thrifting, you go into the store, and the first thing that you notice is the lovely smell of thrifting. And for me, that's the smell of the hunts, that's the smell of victory, that we're about to find something great. And so what you do is my wife and I, we enter in, and then I say, I love you, and she goes to the women's section, and I go to the men's section. Actually, the first section I go to is the book section, because I, yeah, I'm on a hunt for old school pastoral manuals. So I'm often looking for them, I've got a collection started, very exciting. But then you go through the, you don't know what you're gonna find. It's so much treasure hunting, right? So you're looking through the racks, hopefully not getting kind of dirty. No, it's all clean, hopefully. And so you're going through and you see, oh, is that good, is that gonna fit? And then when you find a treasure, it feels incredible. Can anybody ever here experience the thrifting high? Yes, there's a few of us, Emma, yes, there's a lot of us that you find an amazing article of clothing for an amazing price, and when you walk out, you feel great. I, uh, to prepare for the sermon, I'm wearing a thrifted shirt and thrifted jeans from Sweden, okay? 
But we love, the, the humans love the idea of finding a treasure and they're worth, they're willing to go through rack after rack after rack or they're willing to dig and dig and dig to find something of value. And I believe Jesus is calling all of us to be treasure hunters in his word. That we would be those that are so excited for the treasures, for the truths, for the things that he has for us, that we would be willing to dig and dig until we find what the Lord would have for us. I want to encourage us as treasure hunters this morning. So let's go and dive into our text this morning. And says this where it starts. Uh, now context, Jesus has been teaching his disciples. And he's been using parables. We are in our parable series. Uh, next week, you're going to see a handsome man. He's going to be preaching. He's going to look a little like me, just a bit more height. And his name is Matthew. And he's going to be actually looking at one of these parables in Matthew 13. But Jesus has been teaching his disciples. To the crowd, he's been speaking in parables. And for those who have come, those who have followed him, he reveals the answer. He's teaching them, how do you interpret these parables? And it's in that context of Jesus teaching, Jesus revealing, that he asks them this question. He says, if you understood all these things, they said to him, yes. Now, if you've read through the Gospels, that to me, that yes feels a little overconfident, right? Actually, just two chapters later, Jesus rebukes them for their hardness of understanding. But they say, yes, we understand. But I still think that they can be honest. I don't think that was a dishonest yes. Because I think it's important. They are growing in their understanding. But when it comes to revelation, comes to understanding, finding the treasures in God's word, the foundation and core of our confidence and our understanding isn't your own capacity. It isn't that you have a really smart brain or the right translation or amazing study nook. The thing that matters most when it comes to saying, yes, I understand, is the truth that you have a good teacher. The reason why they said yes, even though they were, they were slow sometimes and difficult, is that Jesus himself was teaching them. And let me tell you, the same God who created the earth, he's a really good teacher. And now here's the amazing truth, is that he wasn't just teaching disciples back then, is that Jesus is still the teacher. Jesus is still your teacher. Can you believe that? You've got an incredible teacher, and his name is Jesus. And he wants to help unveil the word to you that you would understand him. This word understand, he asks them, do you, do you understand what I've been saying? Is this idea of being able to put things together. Have you been able to put together? He's speaking in parables, and they're taking old things that he's taught them and the scriptures that they knew because these were good Jewish guys. Uh, and perhaps women. We actually don't know if this was just the 12 or maybe a smaller group of the disciples. We're not certain of the size of the group, but it is those who follow Jesus. And he asked them, have you been able to put this together? This understanding is active that you can actually take. I took this, took this. Jesus, you taught that. Yes, I've been able to put it together. They have understood what Jesus is speaking to them. And our foundation this morning is that Jesus is still our teacher. He's still our rabbi. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and for ever good for squarians that he is. And if he was a rabbi then, he's a rabbi now. And Jesus is able to teach you. This isn't, like that in itself is radical. To remind yourself that when you come to the word of God, it's not you and your capacity alone, that you have a good teacher. And Jesus wants to teach you. So let's continue. So again, he asked them, have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And then Jesus says, therefore. So again, therefore, he's looking back. Because he's been teaching them, teaching them good, because they've understood, now he says, therefore, every scribe, someone say scribe, who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house. Now, when we read this, what should happen is there should be this kind of response of, scribe? Say what? Like, what, scribe? Like, we read it and we miss it. 
But for the original audience, when Jesus called them scribe, there would have been this like, say what? That, because at this point, when we read through the Gospels, Jesus doesn't speak very kindly of the scribes and the Pharisees and the lawyers of the law, right? Like you can even read in the next couple chapters, Jesus was rebuking them for their hardness, for the fact that they are hard of hearing and hypocrites. And so now Jesus comes and calls his disciples scribes? This should jump off the page. I love this quote. One author, she says this, Alice McKenzie, a rule of thumb of parable interpretation is this. Identify what is strange about the parable. It is your window into the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew prefers to call it. This is that strange thing in the parable. Often in the past weeks, there's been that thing that, that when you read, the original audience would have been like, what? And that's where you dive in. And in our text today, this idea of the scribes, Jesus calling his disciples a scribe, should wake us up to say, what is he trying to say? Now, it'd be important for us to know what a scribe is. Uh, in the Jewish context, Old Testament, in the time of Jesus, the scribes were those who not only, yes, yeah, sometimes copied the scriptures, but they were highly trained in the ability to interpret and understand the scriptures, and they were also teachers of the scriptures. So this is provocative that Jesus speaking to his disciples, many of whom are teenagers, many of whom are fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, those who didn't make the cut for rabbinical school, he says to them, you are the new scribes in my kingdom. This is amazing. And I believe not only did those immediate disciples have a specific role in the history of the church, but disciples today, that Jesus would call you a scribe that you too can be a scribe for the kingdom. This is incredible. And what's important is this, is that what qualified them, that Jesus called them scribes, wasn't that they were even qualified to be scribes in the sense that everyone would have understood. What qualifies them is that they were disciples, that they were willing, that they were pursuing the Lord, their ears were open, qualified them to be able to hear and receive teaching from Jesus, and that's good news for us. We often again think it comes down to my capacity, that I'm smart, that I'm this or that. What qualifies you as a scribe in the kingdom is that you've become a disciple, that you've decided to follow him, that there is a willingness, a, a, hum, a humility to say, Jesus, I need you, and now I follow you. In the text, it says, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom that word trained there is actually the same word as discipled. So it could be interpreted in other translations, maybe the one you're reading, that scribes who have become disciples of the kingdom are like, and then it get, or like a master of the house. That Jesus disciples his people, that when we choose to follow him, that we are also invited to become scribes. Now this is important that he would call them scribes because a title speaks to identity and purpose. We can see this throughout the ministry of Jesus for in training of his disciples. He calls them children of God. That speaks to our identity, that we are loved and we are valued, but it also speaks to our purpose, that he is our father. We are our children. It helps us understand the nature of our relationship with him. Uh, Jesus calls his disciple sheep. Last week, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike, where's Pastor Mike? That was an amazing message. If you haven't heard Pastor Mike's message from last week, I'd encourage you to do so. Super good, talking about lost sheep. We are called sheep, which reminds us that we have one who cares and tends for us, but it also reminds us that we have a purpose to follow after our good shepherd. Jesus calls his disciples fishers of men, which reminds them they've got a job to do. They have a purpose to reach other people. A title denotes identity and purpose. Even the word disciple that we are called conveys something about what we're called to do. A disciple means a learner. It means a pupil. Back in that culture, you'd have a rabbi, a teacher, and disciples would follow them and learn. Did you know that's what is part and parcel of following Jesus, is that you're a learner? Sometimes I think we forget that, is that part of our job as disciples in the literal term is that we are learners. 
that we want to be pupils. We want to study. We want to be those that go after Jesus. And then Jesus says to his disciples that you are scribes for the kingdom. That this is amazing, that, that you have the ability not only to read and understand Scripture, but the ability to teach it as well, which is a provocative thought. This is incredible, and I believe that Jesus, not only is he your teacher, he wants to remind you that you too are invited to be a scribe in the kingdom. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, does that mean everyone is going to be a teacher in the sense that they might come on stage or might teach at a Bible school or have the opportunity to teach a large group of the church? No. We can see in Scripture there are some that are gifted with a special capacity and calling to teach, which gives them a greater responsibility when they, dissent, when they talk about God's Word. There are people with that specific gift that are much have just an, a capacity and understanding that God has given them a spiritual gift in teaching. It's kind of like my outfit. One thing that I failed to let you know about this nice shirt and these nice pants is that they weren't treasures that I found. They were found by a treasure hunting expert, someone that is uniquely gifted and called of the Lord to discover hidden gems in thrift stores and, gar I don't know, garage sales, her name is Kelsey Eliason, and she is an amazing preacher and pastor and mother and one of my wife's best friends. And she found these things and said, would Ryan want them? Sometimes they get texts. It's awesome. And she is a special gifting to find things at a higher rate. But here's the thing. You may not, and actually most of us in this room, may not be called to teach large groups of people. But all of us can be teaching somebody. That we are all called to be teachers, to encourage one another, to encourage those that, have made, that are newer and younger than us, to encourage and teach and reveal truths to those people that we meet on the bus. That you may not have a calling to preach to large groups, but we all do have a calling to speak to the one-on-one, -on -one, to reveal the truths that Jesus has given us. Now, what could, that, what could that sound like? What would that sound like that we would become uh, teachers, and it might sound something like this, as we've been studying the Bible, we might be chatting with our friends and someone brings something up and we might simply say, hey, last week I was studying in my Bible and it said this, and you can bring a treasure to them. Maybe you are just, again, God put something on your heart as you're at work with a coworker that doesn't know Jesus. You say, hey, I've heard this before, and you can bring them a thought that maybe they don't, have never heard before. It says this in Hebrews chapter 5. It's going to be on the screen. Verse 11. And it says, About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. The author of the book of Hebrews, one of the challenges that he's writing into is that, again, he has to remind them, your ears are closed, your hearing has become dull. And he speaks to them. For though by this time you ought to be teachers. He's speaking to the church. He's speaking to a group of people, not just individuals. You ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For whoever, everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, which would indicate that there's some skills required to understanding the word. And we'll get back to that. Uh, verse 13, for everyone, oh, uh, righteousness, verse 14. But solid food is for the mature. It's God's desire that you would be mature. That you too would have the skills to be able to understand God's word. But the solid food is from the church. For those who have their powers of discernment trained. Someone say trained. Again, this is the idea of being discipled, being equipped by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. That when it comes to understanding God's word, that all of us can be teachers in some capacity, but it's going to require some skill and some training for us to do it well. What I want to remind us of is this, is we're not just hearers of the word, but we can also be understanders of the word. And that's important. That's true for you. God would call us all to be scribes. Let's keep going. The next thought is this, is that it's treasure, not trivial. It's treasure, not trivial. When it comes to the treasure in this text, the, the, the parable is revealing that what the treasure is, is the revelation of Jesus. It's his teaching. It's the understanding that he has brought, his very word is the treasure. 
which is important for us to remind ourselves is that God's word is valuable. Now, I'm not saying this to this church, but to the church down the street. What can happen sometimes is this, is does our lives and do, does our time and our focus and our energy indicate and reflect the value of this word? There's some studies out there that would indicate that of the two billion Christians in the world, only 30% of them will ever read the whole Bible, which when we believe is God's word to us and treasure seems kind of shocking. More than, uh, less than half of Christians in North America read their Bible more than once a week. That would indicate perhaps that we don't view it as treasure, but we view it as trivial. Kind of important, but not really important. I want to encourage us that God's word is valuable. It is the word from the God of the universe, a God who reveals himself to us, that you might know him, that you might know yourself, that he might guide you and lead you. His word is valuable, reveals who he is. It leads to life. It leads to freedom. It builds your faith. It guides you and can bring you peace. His word is a treasure that we have the opportunity to be those that read and uncover and hunt for treasure, and it is valuable. It is beautiful, not only for us, but for those around us as well. Would we be convicted in a new way that God's word is a treasure, a treasure worth hunting for, to go through those smelly racks God's word is not a smelly rack, but that's the illustration that I was talking about, about thrifting, that we would be diligent to find the gold, find the truth that God would have for us because it is so valuable. If we had more time, I'd encourage you, look at the history of how we ended up with these words today. God values his word. May we value it as well. Next thing we want to see as we walk through this text, again, have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house, which is amazing that the, 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 in this parable that we are like a master of a house, someone who owns a house, someone who has some treasure, has some things of value. The value is the word of God who brings out of his treasure what is new and old, what is new and old. It's interesting that the treasure is described both new and old. Sometimes in our culture, we value only what is new. Have you ever been to the Apple store before? Right? Maybe, maybe you've joined the club or the cult, depending on how you describe it, but you have an iPhone, you have Apple products. I'm covering the logo there. But when you go into the Apple store, what do you notice? Other than a bunch of young people wearing T-shirts, uh, a bunch of things attached with aircraft cable because we can't trust one another anymore, I guess. But you walk into the Apple store, and what you notice is that everything is brand new. There's value in it because it is new. It's so funny. The, the, the iPhone that I have is probably like two iPhones old. They're just giving those away. It's still a fantastic phone. My phone could probably still send a spaceship to the moon compared to the technology back in the day, but it, because it's simply two years old, it's not valuable anymore. We live in a culture that thinks that's what is most new. And then the best part about the Apple store, I not the best part, this is me being facetious, is the best part is they sell you this iPhone and you love it. Look at all these features. Look what it can do. And then they go around, and what do they tell you? But wait, next month, there's a new phone coming out, right? But we often value what is new. But I want to encourage us, there's also value in what is old. That in the kingdom, there is a newness. There is a freshness in God's word, a revelation. God's word is living and active, and we value that. But sometimes we forget that there is value in the old. Kind of like this. Let me show you. Uh, this is another a thrift store find from a friend of mine. This is a stapler. Look at this stapler. Now, you guys might think that this is just some old metal stapler, not very fancy. But for me, it has a lot of value. This stapler is nearly 80 years old. This stapler was built in Sweden, which, 
which indicates that it is quality, uh, that it is ergonomic, that all these things. We're having hot dogs later. Now, let me tell you, I'm Swedish. I am so excited for hot dogs. It's going to be good. But I have this, and it has more value because it is old. It stood the test of time. It's still staples. So one of my friends found this, saw that it was from Sweden, and brought it to me. And I still love my stapler. I'm just going to put it here so we can admire. Actually, cool story. The company that made this during the war made military equipment. So the same company that was making guns and bombs then recalibrated and started making staplers after the war. That, this thing is bomb-proof because the people that made it used to make bombs. Anyway, but it has value because it's old. It's to the test of time. Here's the thing. What is Jesus saying? When he talks about in the kingdom, is the, those who've been trained have treasures, new and old, is that not only do we have fresh understanding and revelation, Jesus is thinking about what he's been teaching. He said, you've heard it said, but I say. He's been interpreting the Old Testament and giving them fresh understanding through who he is. But here's the good news, is that we still value the Old Testament. We still value those foundations, those things that indicate who God is and his work in the world, in the kingdom, there's treasure in the new and the old. We want to know the old. We want to be grounded in it. It becomes a platform for us to be able to understand what God is doing. There is uh, newness in the kingdom, but we also value the old. It's still a treasure for us. Now, the question is maybe perhaps why is the new listed first? You know, in our Bibles, they've decided to put the old covenant first and then the new covenant, which is what testament means in Latin. It's a long story. Uh, not that long. That's pretty much it. But they have, <laughs> but they, we have this first and then after. Why is it first? Well, I think this is why. Because we can only fully understand the old when we interpret it through the new. That Jesus is the only way that we can fully understand what God was intending to say through the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, is when we look through the lens of Jesus. When we were kids, we would, in cereal boxes or in Happy Meals, you would get different toys. And they used to get these toys, and on a sheet of paper, just be a bunch of random lines, or you don't even know what it was. Or, or maybe you had a spy kit or something like that. I know some of my rich friends had spy kits. Uh, and, like, there would be this, like, mess of things you didn't know. But you would take this lens, often red, and you would hold it over the jumble, and then it would clarify. You would see the hidden message. You had the right lens helped you understand what it was trying to say. When it comes to understanding God's word and interpreting, the most important tool for us to understand the world is the lens of Jesus Christ. If we want to understand the new, we look through Jesus. We look through what he's done, his death, burial, and resurrection, the new covenant in Jesus. We look at the gospel, and it helps us interpret the old when we look at it through the lens of what God has been doing in the newness of Jesus Christ. But I want to encourage us this morning that the lens of Jesus, which is not just simply rose-colored glasses, but it's the blood of Jesus, that when we can not only use the lens of Jesus to understand the scriptures better, because he is on every page. He is on every page, the promises, the foundation, the, the, the foreshadowing, all those things, the prophecy and the old are speaking about Jesus. But we can take that same lens and we can apply it to our very lives. You can apply the lens of Jesus to your heart and it can make sense of your chaos. When you look at your family, you can apply the lens of Jesus and see your family the correct way. Maybe we look at our culture and the confusion around us. What do we do? We look through the lens of Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his salvation. And it makes understanding that we would truly know what's happening in the world around us. You might be confused in your heart about who you are. The answer isn't the lens of your own understanding. If you're confused about who you are, if you're confused about your future, if you're confused about your family, the way that we find clarity is through the lens of Jesus because he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And if you want to understand your world, you start looking through the lens of Jesus. Jesus is the way. He brings clarity to our chaos, wisdom to our world, and meaning 
to our mess. Now, I want to encourage us, as we've been thinking about this treasure, what we're thinking about is reading God's word, understanding it, interpreting it, but gaining this treasure, right? It's a storehouse. When it talks about that text, it's this idea of like a treasure chest, right? This store manager, he's all this treasure, and we can gain more treasure as we dig into God's word. But what's important is this, is that the treasure is not just for you. It says that the, the manager of the house would bring out of a treasure what is old and new. Why is he bringing his treasure out? Is he bringing his treasure out so he can ogle it, as one author said? I think that's a funny word. Uh, does he bring it out so he can shine it? Does he bring out so he can swim in it? I'm thinking about DuckTales and uh, Scrooge McDuck. Is anybody getting that reference? There's five of us, praise the Lord. No, the reason why he brought the treasure out, the clear implication was that he would share it. We are treasure hunters not to just build our bank account of insights and wisdom. We are treasure hunters that we might be scribes and dispense of what God has given us. That every blessing we receive in the kingdom, this is a kingdom truth, that 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 you've been blessed with is intended to not only bless you, but to bless those around you. If you've been blessed with finances, you have the opportunity to be generous. If you've been forgiven by the Lord, guess what? We can forgive others. Every blessing we receive is intended to flow in and through us. And that's true for every scribe, and that's true for you that you can be a recipient recipient a recipient of revelation of jesus teaching and he wants to reveal things to you so as pastor craig would say that it can then flow through you because that's the nature of the kingdom and that includes you that you can understand the word you can interpret it and then you can share it with others we give away what we receive. I want to speak to parents this morning. You need to build your treasure because it's God's design that you would be the primary disciplers of your children. Can I get an amen? Sometimes we think, guess what? The youth pastors at Horizon are incredible. They are. Their leaders are so smart and handsome. They are. The kids ministry team, wow, the best. They are but they're not the primary disciples of your children. You are. So we have a responsibility as parents, and I'm really grateful that I can now say we, praise the Lord. We have a responsibility of parents to receive and understand the word of God that we would be able to share it with them, to teach them God's truth, to teach them to value the word, to teach them how to interpret it and to understand it, that we have an opportunity to gain the treasures that Jesus gives us and give it to our children. Would you have treasures for your kids? The treasures we gain are intended to be given away. Now, as we close this morning, there's a few things I'm really excited for. Because again, we were talking about earlier, I think that God has something in store for a number of you this morning. But I wanna get practical for a moment. So we know that we're called and invited to be treasure hunters, those that would dive into God's word, to hear from Jesus himself as he brings understanding and clarity, wisdom and revelation that we would then be able to give it away, to be able to teach. But here's the thing is, how do we grow in our ability to be able to do that? Hebrews indicates that it requires some skill, which means we can grow in it, that there's, there's important things. So I want to spend a moment getting super Practical, application time, application station, here we go. How can you build your storehouse? How can you add treasures to your treasure chest that you might give it away? Well, here we go. I'm going to go rapid fire. Now, it makes me think about panning for gold. I've never panned for gold except maybe when I was a kid when we went to like a museum and they put fake gold in there and like, oh, look, I found the gold. No. But here's the thing. There are different tools that you can use to find gold. The base tool is a, a pan and water and right you sift it through but there are increasingly other skills and other tools you can use to find treasure maybe you've watched that uh, show gold rush anybody ever seen gold rush on discovery yeah we don't have cable so sometimes when we're in a hotel we can watch things like house hunters and gold rush anyway 
But what they did is you discovered they're not, they're, they're not using pens. They've got some sophisticated tools. They've got backhoes and machines. There's this one show. They've got a barge with an industrial-sized vacuum and a guy in a pressurized scuba suit. And they're sucking sand. And they're getting all this gold. It's incredible. I want to be able to lay out some tools some ways that we can grow in our understanding. And the foundational tool that every scribe needs to have to be a treasure hunter is actually can be taught to us by a song. Anybody like singing? I like singing. I'm going to teach you a song that we learned in Sunday school. Maybe you know it, so sing along. The most important tool to be able to interpret, to understand, receive revelation from God's Word is... Read your Bible, pray every day, pray every... We're going to keep going. Pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Round of applause, choir. Well done. <laughs> Next time, Horizon has a choir. I want to see everybody on the stage. No. So the most important tools for interpreting God's word, number one, read your Bible. <laughs> that sounds like rocket science, but here's the thing we often don't. And the way that you can understand the Bible is by getting familiar with the Bible. The more you read it, the more you understand. You get different parts and different sections. Read your Bible. But here's the good news is that song teaches us this incredible truth of the kingdom. That we don't just read the Bible alone. Again, it's not your own capacity. It's not your own skill or your own mind that can figure it all out. No, we read the Bible and pray. When you read your Bible, you, praying is one of the most important things you do. And what are we asking when we pray? We're praying, God, would you open up my understanding? Help me to understand this world. Because guess what? God's a good teacher. He wants you to understand. And so when you read your Bible, you come to it humbly and you say, Lord, would you open it up to me? And you read your Bible with the eyes of faith. The Holy Spirit has come to help you understand. The same Spirit that inspired authors over thousands of years to write these words is the same Spirit that illuminates to the hearts and minds of disciples even today. And so we can read our Bibles, we pray, we remind ourselves that the helper, the Holy Spirit in John says, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. He can only remind you what you've put in. So that's why it's important that you read your Bible as you pray. Now, here's the thing. It's also important for us to think of frequency. And when I say frequency, I don't mean safe and fun for the whole family. Praise 106.5. When, when I think frequency, it says read your Bible, pray every day. It's one of those things that the more you do it, the more you understand, the more you dive in. And if it's truly a treasure, this is a joy that we can be treasure hunters. We open the Bible. God speaks to us in these amazing moments. And we can do it every day. Now, sometimes every day, there are some days, let's be honest, it feels like a duty, right? Something I have to do. But the more you do it, I promise you. And if this isn't true for you, I'll give you your money back. You didn't pay anything, so I don't owe you anything. But... But here's the thing, is that sometimes it starts as a duty, but eventually will become a delight as you become familiar and as you grow in your understanding. It gets really exciting when you open God's word because a word can jump. You read a sentence and you're like, God's speaking to me. It's possible for you as well. We read our Bibles, we pray every day, and you will grow, grow, grow in your ability to understand, interpret, and then be able to teach others what God has been speaking to you. And when it comes to read your Bible, pray every day, this tool, we don't move on from this tool. There are other sophisticated tools, if you will, but we never leave these tools. We never replace them with the things I'm going to talk about. The foundation for Bible understanding is always reading it with an awareness that God is your teacher and prayerfully, humbly coming to him. That's always the foundation. We don't graduate beyond the pan when we pan for gold. What are some other tools? Let's go quickly, although we've got lots of time, I think. Oh, maybe I went a little long. Here we go. Uh, we want to read our Bible. We want to pray every day. I would encourage you, these are some rapid fire things to help you. One of the things that helped me most in my ability to understand as a young, as a young preacher, I became a preacher at our youth group because our youth pastor quit. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I'm like, 
they're like, who's speaking next week? And they looked around, and I said, I guess I am. And so you know what I use to help me interpret scripture? My NIV study Bible. Get yourself a good study Bible. We're not experts on everything, but understanding the language, culture, background of a text can help you understand its meaning. Having a study Bible, that's a really good idea. More hints and tricks, how do we understand and interpret God's word? The next time Horizon puts on Hearing God, I would encourage you, take Hearing God. You can hear from God. Very important that you understand that one. And we keep going, more tips of how do we find the treasure don't hunt for treasure alone. I'd encourage you, when you study scripture, you do it alone, there's good times. Invite people in. Ask, hey, with your spouse, with your friends, join a small group, because when you go together, you have other people that the Spirit can speak to and reveal God's word when you do it as a team. Then there's other resources that you could use to help you grow in your understanding. One of them is a really good book, and there's others, but it's called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. It gives you tips and tricks of how do you understand and read God's word well. Because here's the thing, you can also read it wrong, right? Now, I'm not trying to produce fear in you because our, his sheep hear his voice, but we can read it wrong and get to wrong conclusions. How do we read it well? Who here would say that they're kind of a new Christian and they would really love to be able to understand God's word more? Is anyone who would say that that might be them? Anybody that's willing or brave to put a hand up, they're kind of a newer to the whole thing. Uh, right over there, uh, Peter's going to be running things. If you want to give them that book, there's a book called Hearing God's Voice. There's other resources that can be helpful. Uh, there's a website called The Bible Project, really helpful. Helps you to understand that the scripture is one big story, not just a bunch of random stories. And great resources. The Bible Project, Google it. There's a lot of great resources there. There's also things like... Uh, 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 well, different textbooks you could read. This one's called Biblical Interpretation. Anybody here would say that I have done some teaching, I have some understanding, but I want to go to the next level. I think the Lord's convicting me. Anybody would say that that's true for them? We see who? Uh, over there, if you want to go give that one to somebody, that would be fantastic. That's a book just how do we in interpret Scripture. Lots of good resources. O also, what can be very helpful for people, this one is awesome. It's called The Handbook for the Bible. Handbook for the Bible. This one has pictures and charts, helps you understand. So when you read your Bible, you're like, what does that mean? You can take a look at it. Who's here, again, that would say that I want to grow? There we go, Peter. There's one behind you. There we go. Uh, that one, I also have this one. This is a really big one. Is Sam here? Sam Rowe, is Sam here? Or his parents here? Wait, I think they're in kids' ministry. I'm going to give this to another guy that is, uh, I'm going to give that one. So thank you, Pastor Greg. Let's give a big round of applause to Pastor Greg. Oh, hey. Oh, hey. Last thought. Let me speak to those who would say that you sense that God has put a call on your heart to be a teacher. And you've, you've kind of let it go dormant. This isn't for everybody. This is just for probably a few people. I would encourage you, steward the gift. If, God, if you've sensed that God's called you to teach, and to grow in that, steward the gift. Is there a course that you're taking? Is there a Bible school that you're taking courses at? Perhaps Pacific Life Bible College. Uh, again, you can still enroll for the September. Uh, it's a good thing to do. There's great classes like Biblical Interp 1, 2, 3, Old Testament, New Testament. Lots of great courses you can take. I would encourage you, if you've sensed that God's put it on a heart and you let it sit, let it go dormant. God wants to call you to remind you that he's called you to be a scribe, to understand and teach God's word. Can I have Katie come up as we close? Last thought for us this morning. I want to speak to those who are thinking, yes, Ryan, I can be a, yes, all this kind of stuff. But I can't understand the Bible. That's what you're thinking to yourself. I've tried. Find nice message, funny jokes about your thrifted pants. But you would think to yourself, I can't. It's just not possible for me. Who told you that? Who told you that you can't understand scripture? I think Jesus is pretty clear, is that you can. I wanna encourage you that if you have followed Jesus and become a disciple, it means you're a learner, which would indicate that you have a teacher, that Jesus wants to help you learn, that he is with you. This morning, I actually wanna pray for some people, because some of you are thinking, I can't understand the Bible. That's for Pastor Craig to do. I'll just hear him once a week and we'll kind of move on. No, you can understand God's word. And for some of you, you're thinking to yourself, maybe your parents when you were younger or a teacher said, you're slow. 
Or maybe they say you've got a, you're dyslexic or you've got something that's going to make it hard for you to understand and you just think, I can't understand scripture. That is a lie. That is not true. Jesus is a good teacher and it's his capacity and his ability that matters more. What matters more is your willingness and he can take care of the rest. And one of the ways he can take care of the rest is by breaking off the lies that you've believed about yourself that you're not smart, your IQ's too low, all of those things are lies, they're not true. You can understand God's word. I also wanna pray for freedom for those who maybe say, I think I can understand it, but every time I get to read my Bible, I get a headache. Or every time I read my Bible, I fall asleep, and you find that there's some resistance that is possible, that the enemy, we, we, the enemy doesn't want you to read and understand God's word. And for some of you, he's working overtime. And I want to speak freedom and healing in Jesus' name, that your attention span would increase, that your path capacity would increase, that lives would fall off in Jesus' name. Because we have a God who sets us free. He leads us into all truth, and that includes you this morning. So if you're here this morning, if you just close your eyes, everyone, this is just because we don't want to like highlight anybody. But if you want to close your eyes this morning, the good news about this message is applies to everybody. If you're not a Christian, trust Jesus and he'll help you understand the word. If you're a new Christian, grow in your understanding. Read your Bible. If you've been a Christian for a long time, continue diligent in your studies, honoring the word. It's valuable. Everyone applies. But if you hear this morning, you say, when I read my Bible, I feel that it's difficult, that it's hard, that there's a resistance for me to get in. Maybe you've believed a lie from somebody else that you're just not smart enough. You can't do it. If that's you this morning, if you just want to simply quick put your hand up so I can pray for you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. There's hands going up. If that's you, I want to pray because I believe in a God who sets us free. Amen. Okay, you can put your hands down. Let's take a moment. If you want to join me, church, in faith as we pray for these brothers and sisters. Lord, I thank you that you are a good God. And our confidence is in you alone. Your confidence to teach us. Your confidence to be a revealer that you have revelation for your children. And so, God, I pray that every lie of the enemy would be broken in Jesus' name that every doubt, that every fear would fall off in Jesus' name, and we would be bold as we enter into your word. For those who have felt rejected or not good enough, that they don't measure up, we break that off in Jesus' name. We trust in you, Jesus. And I pray for those who are coming against oppression from the enemy. We rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. I pray for freedom in every mind, freedom in every heart, that as we pursue your word, as we are diligent, that we would discover an open pathway in Jesus' name. So God, I speak healing for every body, for every mind that we would understand and walk in the victory and freedom of your word in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with me this morning as we close? Pastor Janice is going to come up. I want to read one last scripture, and it says this. It's going to be on the screen. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. At this time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from wise and understanding and revealed. Someone say revealed them to little children. This is a room full of little children, those who are children of God. God reveals things to you. You're a scribe. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except for the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and to anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. If you're this morning, you love Jesus. God picked you to reveal himself to you, to reveal his kingdom truths to you, to open his word to you. He's a revealer to which you pursue him. And then it says, come to me. That's Jesus inviting us. Come to him. All who labor, all who are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Jesus is your teacher. If you don't remember anything this morning other than my Swedish stapler, would you be reminded that Jesus is your teacher and he is a good teacher because he says for I'm gentle lonely in heart and you'll find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light have a great week be blessed 
and happy treasure hunting. Pastor Daniel.